Hello, everyone, and welcome to Intimacy with the World podcast. I am Dorita Holm, your host on this show, where we explore what it really means to be human and what really matters to be able to live a meaningful life. And today I am speaking with Kelly Wendorf. She is an author, a socially responsible entrepreneur, a horsewoman, an outdoors woman, and an expert in the art form of taking people through transformative change and on to their greatest levels of success, meaning, purpose, and pro profound fulfillment. And she has been walking alongside people, helping them navigate transformation for about 25 years and has extensively researched this question. What conditions need to be created to allow people to live a life of deep authenticity, freedom, and joy. Having experienced numerous tectonic shifts in her own life, she intimately knows the landscape of metamorphosis and transformative change. And her work with her clients has been featured in Forbes, in Vogue, in the Huffington Post, and the New York Times. So I'm very honored to have her here on my podcast. And um, her new book is called Flying Lead Change. 56 million years of wisdom for leading and living. And this has just been released by Sounds True. And she works um, remotely with clients all over the world and in person along her herd of seven horses on her ranch just outside Santa Fe in New Mexico. So welcome, Kelly. I am so excited to speak with you. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, I'm so happy already that we're getting to know each other like this. Thank yes. you so much for the time. Yeah, I, I read your book and I was very, very, very impressed. I mean, I, I grew up with horses, but even so, and I read so many books, and even so, I was reading your book and I was thinking, wow, I've never heard about this before. And what, wow, this is very interesting. You know, so I, I really, it was such a, a treat to read your book. So, um, mm -hmm. so I'm excited to dig in. Um, I'm going to start with the introduction to your book. You say in the introduction that as a young woman, life felt so confusing and that this kindled a voracious drive to seek insight and answers so that you could thrive at being a human being. So mm -hmm. what was so difficult? Not, I mean, I know, but... <laughs> right. Yeah. What's so difficult about being human? Yes. Um, you know, I didn't really know why then. Of course, I would think I was too young to process it. But um, looking back, I, w I was very empathic and am a very empathic person. I'm very porous. And I felt things, um, <clears throat> I felt a lot of things. And, and, and because of that, I, I was sort of intimately acquainted with other people's suffering and, but especially like the suffering of the planet and the trees and the animals. And so, um, and I think that made me a little bit awkward as a child too. And, and so I didn't understand the, the rules of engagement with people that much either. So, um, so yeah, I was very ambivalent about this, you know, being born and, um, and <laughs> it just was, it was uncomfortable, deeply uncomfortable. Yeah. And was that more so, even more so as a teenager and a young woman? Well, um, that's a great question. I, I think, I think I found different coping mechanisms as I got older um, so it seemed like it wasn't as difficult, but, but then of course there was a price to pay for those coping mechanisms. So, you know, had you asked me at 18, if it, if I was, you know, ambivalent about being human, I may not have said that to you then. Um, but of course, you know, then at around 26, those coping mechanisms start to take up, you know, a toll, they have a price. Um, and the cost started to show up in, in my relationships and my, in my own happiness and well-being. And it kind of caught up with me. So, um, so I think around that time, around 26 was when I became super serious about, okay, so how do I want to live my life and who am I? And, and, and the questions that you're asking in this podcast, like, what yeah. does it mean to be human? Yeah. Yeah. And, and how, where, how did you go about searching for answers at 26? Because it's like, you know, intuitively that something, there's got to be another way. 
but where do you start? Well, I, let's see, I think, I think, well, my first way in was, of course, horses. Horses have been in my life, you know, since I was very tiny. Um, <clears throat> and about 26, um, I was living in a big city in Texas in America and working in a, for a large corporation. And I had a kind of crisis of identity. Um, and I decided that you know, I just saw my life playing out from that point forward. If that, if I decided to keep playing that game of, um, you know, more materialism, more uh, uh, bigger jobs, uh, you know, a, a larger career, and I just saw the whole trajectory was, okay, I'll buy a house, I'll have kids, we'll join the country club, then we'll retire, and it was like, oh my God, that just just sounds so awful. So. Um, so I abruptly moved back to my hometown, which is Santa Fe, New Mexico in the mountains. I think the land, you know, the land did something to me when I returned back to those magical mountains. Um, I opened a riding school and started working with people and horses. And I started to see that, wow, when people and horses are together under the right conditions, changes happen for, for people, changes happen for the horses. So I became very curious about, well, what is that? What, what makes people more courageous? What makes them leave toxic marriages? What makes them get along with their siblings? Because um, I had a lot of adults and children in the riding school. And that sparked this, hey, there's a way, there must be a way to become a better human, to, um, to have joy in one's life um, and fulfillment. So what is that way? Um, and, it, and I didn't find it through the horses at first. Um, in fact, I left everything and went to India. Um, also also the searching, mm -hmm. also searching. Exactly. Yeah. So that was sort of the doorway through um, and, and met different teachers in India, but settled with, with one that was very formative for me up in, in Uttar Pradesh yeah. um, named Punjaji. And he is in the lineage of Ramana Maharshi. Yeah. Um, and, and really it's just a very simple process of self-inquiry that happens there of dropping into this moment, this presence, beingness. Um, so, so I spent a lot of time there um, before I then returned back to working with horses so yeah. that was the way so when you returned to the horses after being in india and learning about presence i mean even the word presence most people don't even know what it really means you know and even people who study it or try to feel presence for for years you can always go deeper and deeper into presence mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. not a it's not a simple well, it's a it's a concept, but to actually live it is is quite another thing. So when you came back from learning about pressing and practicing presence and then being with the horses again, was that different? I mean, did you well, see the horses in a different way? It it took it took some time. You know, there were some different um, places my life took me. Uh, motherhood, for one. Um, yes, I, I had two children, and I and I chose to have them at home and do a home birth, and that that was also a spiritual journey. Yeah. Um, I immigrated to Australia and, you know, initially I thought, well, this should be easy. They look like me, you know, we talk the same language. It's, it must be the same culture, but it really isn't the same culture. <laughs> and, no. and that was a big spiritual journey um, and, and meeting indigenous elders there and working with one in particular. So all of this happened even before um, the horses came back into my life. Um, and then I did, I got, I became very ill when I was in Australia. Um, and I was told that my body didn't know how to navigate the other hemisphere. And oh. it was the, you know, the, the, the polarities or something are different. And, and so I was told by my um, healer, you know, there's a horse waiting for you in a field and the horse will help to um, sort of surrogate your relationship to the earth down here in Australia. And sure enough, 
within weeks, um, someone um, had a horse they wanted me to look at and buy, and he was in a field, and <laughs> he <laughs> was a beautiful black creature, um, and he, he did, I became well just by being in his presence because, you know, he was so grounded on the earth, mm. and that was, you know, the earth has always been a place where I have returned to myself, like when I went back to Santa Fe from the big city when I was younger. So grounding back into the earth in Australia was very important. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was engaging with my horse in the same way I had learned, which was this very conventional power over dynamic. You know, yeah. you're the human, you're the boss, you know, the horse needs to do what you're told. And, and I was a very accomplished um, professional show dressage rider. So I, I started out that way, um, but this horse didn't have, want to have anything to do with that way. Um, and if I, if I attempted to kind of clash against his will in the way that I had been taught, it was going to be very bad for both of us. Um, so I struggled with how to but I had no idea. I had heard about, you know, natural horsemanship and horse whispering and all of this, but it just, it didn't make any sense to me. It was my daughter who said, um, mom, I don't want to learn to ride like how you learn to ride. And so I, I, I said, how old is she? How old is she eight then? years old. Yeah. In all for eight year old wisdom, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful to learn from our, ch our children. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, as you know, right? And um, so I set out to find someone who is sort of part child whisperer, part unicorn, part horse whisperer, you know, who is this person? Yeah. And I, I found her and uh, her name's Louise Kropak and she's in the book. Um, and she, she, upon encountering the way she was with horses, yeah. it everything I had learned in India, everything that I had sort of, gone through spiritually and learned from my beloved uncle Bob and um, who's an elder in Australia and, and all, it all came kind of pouring in and it, it was such a wake up moment for me um, of shifting a very fundamental shift from seeing the other in this case the horse as as separate from me you know, that there, there, that I, it relationship just finished. And there's that, as Martin Buber calls the I thou relationship. Yeah. And, and that we are a mutualism. We're, we're more even than a mutualism. We're one yeah. ultimately. Right. But that, and that my success in that relationship was absolutely dependent upon me being in that mutualism in a, in not in a hierarchy. You know, I could be his leader, um, but that true leadership isn't a hierarchy. Yeah. So, it's so very, that, yeah, yeah I, it's that's a long, yeah. yeah go ahead. But it's so interesting how, how you can have the theory, because you must have heard about theories in India about oneness and, and there's no separation right. and so on. Right. And then actually <laughs> integrating it into, to knowing that this is actually the way things exist. I can feel it. This is how I see you. I don't see you as somebody who's below me, no? Exactly. And I'm so glad that you said that because it has been my experience that lofty spiritual ideals do not ever actualize unless you're willing to put it into form. It, it has to be embodied, right? Um, like, as you know, childbirth is such a, an amazing way in to that something very um, kind of existential and esoteric. And so many, um, so many spiritual practices tend to kind of seek some kind of disembodied, you know, that ascension is out there somewhere and it's actually in the body and with yeah. another body, whether that be a human or a tree or yeah. a horse, right? And it, yeah. yeah, so much of spirituality wants to transcend this body and this human life. And that this human life, if we, if we learn to integrate uh, ancient wisdom, is so beautiful. It's painful, yeah. painful, but yeah. also very beautiful when we, when we learn to, to be in our body and, and to live life from there. 
Yes. Yeah. It's down and in, not up and out. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I totally, I couldn't right. agree more. Yeah. <laughs> I, love what you, I love what you say in the, in the book. You say that, that your book is a field guide to being human. I love that. <laughs> we all need a field guide to being human. Yeah. And do this. Yes, we do. And then you say that the natural world has taught you more about being human than any person could. And, mm -hmm. and how is that, that the natural world that can't even speak our language, like, like I, we're speaking now, so how could that be? Where, where, how could that be that you learned the most? Um, well, the, the human world has over time, you know, through some, somewhere along the line, we, in history, we picked up the idea that we are alone that we're separate from the universe, from all things. And as soon as that kind of existential aloneness set in as a, as a belief system, then we created all kinds of strategies to um, somehow fix or mend that sense of aloneness. But it was built on a mirage, right? Because we're not alone and we're not separate. And so culture, for example, and I don't mean culture like you know, music and, and dance. I mean, culture as in cultural norms. So much of culture is about this coping strategy of, um, of dealing with this existential aloneness. So culture tells us that these feelings are good and these feelings are bad and these people are good and these people are bad and these behaviors are good and these behaviors are bad. And it's all just a cultural construct. It's not based on anything yeah. factual at all <laughs> um so nature doesn't have culture you know it, um when you watch for example how horses deal with um emotions and energies um there's not a polarizing there's it's all just being with as is so um there's no way to um kind of lie about a scenario or manipulate or pretend that something is when it isn't. Yeah. Um, and so I think prop, to put it very simply, the, the secret to being human is, is being as is, whatever that is. If, if, you know, if anger is there, anger is just there it, it has nothing to do with with you so why like make a thing about it why talk about your anger problem um so so nature has taught me to and it's a practice right and it, yes it's something that it continue i'm continually humbled by but to um not polarize about with things and ideas about things and and simply be as I am, um, and allow others to be as they are. Um, and this isn't a kind of spiritual bypassing, fatalistic, you know, everything's just the way it is kind of thing. It's, it's very vulnerable and uh, powerful and difficult. Yeah. Um, it's quite a practice. Yeah, it is. And it's, it's very much also letting go of the storyline, no? totally like they can go of all the complicated stories of he said that and i did that and i should have done and why didn't he and why didn't mm -hmm. i and so on mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and as you say it's uh it's not an easy practice and it takes it takes practice mm -hmm. it does and the the egoic structures become more and more sophisticated as you drop more and more in so um like you said in the beginning of our of our talk together, you know, it's infinite, really. This this capacity of beingness, it, there's no arrival. There's just de ever deepening, deepening, deepening. Yeah, which is which is fabulous because exactly. then you and I get to get on the call and 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 just have such a great time talking about this stuff. Yes, and also it gives life so much. Uh, life becomes so interesting, no? Because it's like. Well, no matter what happens, you, you can always learn. And mm -hmm. when you have that, that openness to, let's see what we can learn from this situation, then everything becomes interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> the, the first part of your book is called Learning to Listen. And you say that when we truly listen, we suspend what we think we know. 
it allows the subtler voices of wisdom to speak to us while other louder faculties lie dormant. So how, how have you learned to listen and how can we learn to listen more to ourselves and to our own inner, more true voice and, and to others? Mm. Gosh, that's a great question. How have I learned to listen? I think that um, this is where the horses came in as great teachers. And, and you know, the book brings in horses a lot. And of course, it's not about horses. It's about people. It's about humans. Um, so I want to offer that you can learn this from uh, a child. You can learn this from a rock, a river, um, just being in a forest. The, all of these things can be learned from, from nature. Um, but if I was going to, um, or your dogs or cats, right? If I was going to have a, a real authentic relationship with another species then um and so the listening had to happen without words obviously because they don't have words so i had to start to feel in with my body about sort of the energy between us i had to learn to be observant about gestures and facial expressions um, I had to watch habits over time. And, um, and if I didn't, if I, if I was the one doing all the talking, say, um, either by making a lot of demands or by believing a bunch of stories in my head, as you say, about, about the interaction, then the horse very quickly showed me that I was off the mark. And they do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they keep doing it. Um, so, so it's a, it's a fantastic opportunity to, to, to have a live engagement with, with another species because, um, you know, dogs have learned a lot how to, um, how to please humans. Horses don't really kind of think that way. Um, so, but you can still, you know, if you drop in and you, and you just decide to maybe, relate to your dog differently from that place where he just wants to please you that there's another world that's possible there so. yeah yeah for sure and I think it's it's really quite significant that that's the first part of your book because it has to begin there it has mm. to begin with some kind of silence where you learn to listen to yourself and as you were saying learn to listen to another like if you don't start there, then you have to silence yourself a little bit to be able to take something else in, as you say. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And oftentimes when I'm doing like a workshop or something, I'll, I'll invite people to um, that, you know, normally when we're listening, we're listening for agreement, you know, oh yes, I resonate with that. I don't resonate with that. I agree with this. I don't agree with that. And I invite people to just listen for something new or something that completely, you know, is opposite to what they believe. Because if we, if we just listen to agreement, then we just reinforce our own worldview again and again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to listen for something new or something that, you know, is completely outside of what, how you would have thought about it. That, that's such a more, you know, yeah, that, that is so beautiful because it takes radical openness. It takes that you open even further and expand to, be, to even be able to hear something that you're not used to hearing, no? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and the, the, the second part of your book, now, now, that, now that we've learned to listen, <laughs> to <laughs> quiet down so that we're able to take something in, uh, the second part of your book is called Care. And I, I, really, this is, I really learned something here. You said something new here. You say that care is a misunderstood phenomenon. And then you go on to talk about the conservation of energy and how care should not cost us. It should not exhaust us to raise a family, for example, or to create a startup or to, to tend to those in need and to our family. Uh, I thought that was really interesting how you how you talk about care in a different way. Can you expand a little bit on that? Absolutely. So um, again, you know, looking at this 56 million year old system, the horse herd to teach us about things. Um, 
the we're you know we're told in Hollywood and you know cowboy novels and things that the stallion runs the herd that he's like the tough boss um and that's just um that's a you know that's a a, a it's a myth that's perpetrated by the dominant patriarchal paradigm. Um, the herd's actually a matriarchy. And the leader is not the like toughest, the most dominant, um, the most aggressive. The leader is the one who cares the most. Yeah. That's so amazing. when you look, isn't that amazing? Yes. I mean, and imagine. And that, that is, that's one of the points in your book that's so revolutionary. Like, this is really important. So go on. It's really important. You know, we, our culture learned lead, about leadership through military strategies. That's where it kind of started. Um, it was, and, and war settings. And that, you know, that is not, at least according to a 56 million year old system, that's not leadership. If we put those kind of leaders in a herd of horses, they'd be thrown out of the herd immediately. And in fact, that's what the mayors will do. If you're badly behaved, go on out, you're out of here so you can behave yourself and come back in. Even a strong so, stallion, even a strong stallion who wants to show off, he'll be, he'll be excluded from the herd. If he's badly behaved, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, which is, you know, very extreme. Yeah. Because out there alone is very dangerous for an animal prey. Yeah. Um, so the leaders is the one who cares the most <clears throat> and who's the most present, those two principles. So imagine if we selected our leaders, you know, leaders of our schools, of our governments, <laughs> of our companies, <laughs> if who's the most caring and the most present. <clears throat> and then, but if you watch the lead horse, She's not out there running around, like organizing everything. She, she's the one who's moving the least. Yeah. Why is she the one moving the least? Two reasons. First, and probably most importantly, well, I don't know if it is, but energy, we're born with two things, time and energy. That's it, time and energy. <laughs> yes. and, and we have limited of both. And to an animal of prey, Having enough energy is so important because having enough energy to get away from the lion, if you don't have enough energy, you're finished. So you, you don't want to expend energy unnecessarily because that could mean the difference between life and death. So the leader must be the one who conserves the most energy so that she can take off and 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 guide the herd to get away from danger as quickly as possible yeah. so you know every flick of an ear every swish of a tail every you know movement of a foot is deliberate because all of it takes energy so how interesting that she cares but she's also conserving energy so it's it's fascinating to watch how you know this the absence of caretaking um very clear consequences um, letting others experience their own consequences, um, you know, just very clear guidelines about the membership of the herd that, that all evolve, uh, revolve around these principles of safety, connection, peace, joy, and freedom. Yes. Not a bad, not a bad set of values to resonate with. And, and, so, <clears throat> and so she only does what's absolutely necessary for the care of each individual and the whole. Yeah. Um, so, and yeah. then the second reason why, um, you know, a, around her moving the least is that there's the presence piece because she's, it's really more about how she's being than what she's doing. And that her, you know, their electromagnetic field goes out about half a mile. So if you, if you walk into a herd of horses, this pervasive sense of peace, descends upon you because their electromagnetic field is just like resonating with this peacefulness. And, and she, that's kind of part of her job is to allow her nervous system to reach out and affect the nervous system of every other horse. Most of the time it's around calm, safe, you know, peacefulness. Everyone can just be really chill and Zen and kind of meditating or boom, we got to get out of here. Yeah. And then 
back to peace again. So it's, it, she's kind of like this energy generator. Yes. That, you know, is putting yeah, that mon- monitors the energy of the whole herd mm-hmm. and, and, and mm-hmm. regulates it. Like now mm-hmm. we need to be, regulated. now we need to run or yeah. Right. You say, you say that, uh, <laughs> in, in, um, uh, you say that in the modern pace of artificial emergency, I love that, artificial emergency, that's brilliant. Humans unnecessarily expend energy all the time. Everything feels urgent and critical. What if we lived more deliberately, expended energy only specifically, land only when truly required and mm-hmm. only when tru- truly inquired? required that that's uh that would be a whole different life yes (laughs) (laughs) are you are you are you managing to live like that kelly uh you know i am aspiring to and and um and there's certain things that that i do um as a practice to assist with that um and i want to just capture one thing before i go to that piece is what i try to teach my clients especially a lot of these high performing leaders is that is for them to understand that like Artemis, like the lead mare in the herd, that if they were to drop down into their beingness and understand that they, they too can project across time and space and regulate the others so that the others in are, are in a much better mind space and can be more creative and more productive. That's way more powerful than what they say or what they do. So if they, if 80% was how they be, to use bad English, and 20% was what they do and said, that's gonna, that's gonna change things um, and to trust that. And it's tricky with people because people aren't gonna turn to him or her and say, wow, in your company, I just feel so like fabulous. But for them to trust that that, in fact, is what's happening. And so when they come out here and work with the horses, if, if they get to do that, they go into the herd and they get to see their impact on the herd. They get to actually see it happen because the horses just tell the truth about it. So, so for me, it's, again, a, a, an infinite invitation to how much slower can I become. And I, you know, I'm a Gemini. I, I'm mercurial. I move really fast. Um, I'm a Gemini too. (laughs) Are you? (laughs) Yes. So, Um, but I do things like, um, you know, I no longer have Facebook. Uh, I just don't, I don't get involved in any of that. It chews up energy. It chews up time and attention. I think you said Um, in your book that you take two days a week, the whole weekend without uh, email or anything. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. And, you know, unless I choose, excuse me, <clears throat> unless I choose that, you know, there's an email that's, that's really going to be important or essential, but, but, that, but I, but I even have an autoresponder on Fridays that come out and just say, you won't hear from me until, until Monday. I'm trying to stretch it to, to now Fridays and Mondays. So I have four days, but I don't know if that's possible just yet. Yeah, that's um, something everybody should do. Get an autoresponder that I will not respond on. I'm not. I will not respond because you know this whole artificial emergency again. Like texts come in, and everybody's starting to ex- expect and anticipate that you will respond right then and there. And um, and I've had to really um, sort of educate the people around me that this this is my rhythm, and that and also for a large part of the day I'm out with the horses and not around you know any technology technology really does speed things up you know because the speed of technology is just like getting out there right so distancing from technology as much as possible is really helpful um taking good long breaths before a phone call um What are some other things? Having some rituals at the end of the day that um, uh, that that just allow me to think about how the day has gone and what the next day is going to be like, because it's that idea about being deliberate. Um, And also another trick is to have a a set amount of time that I do emails in a day. So I'm, you know, a lot of time we get these dopamine triggers that happen when we respond to an email, respond to an email respond to a text and so we get pinged on our screen and we start letting that drive the momentum 
of our lives. And, and so, you know, take off the, the pinging email and just do your email from 12 to one and the, something like that. Yeah, it's so very you, important. You decide, right? You yeah. you have dominion over the. It's pace. very important that word you say about being deliberate about what you want your life to be. Do you want that to be your life? That your dop- your dopamine rush is all the time, all the day, because of the ping. You haven't even chosen mm-hmm. it. It's not something you've decided. This is what I want my life to be. Right. Right. Exactly. But how about the morning then? Do you have a some kind of morning routine to mm-hmm. to set the course for the day? I do. It's changing. Um, but, um, I like to get up early before the world kind of wakes up and I have my cup of coffee and I do a few, very few little, little kind of, um, they're called the five rites. I don't know if you've ever heard of them, but they're, uh, it's like a Tibetan, um, they're like these flow movements. It's like yes. five movements. Yeah. yeah, the five Tibetans, I think they're called. I, where are, I are they? Yeah. yeah like, like, Whatever like, they like, are. Like, yeah, like yoga, sort of. Yes. They're sort of, yeah. You spin yeah. and then you do some, yeah. They're supposed so I do that. To a lot of longevity. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's, that's what I hear. So that I do those. Um, and then my um, ritual in the morning is to write. Writing for me is totally my church. Um, so I do an hour and a half of writing. An hour so and I, a half? Mm-hmm. Of like journaling because I do that every morning too, but not for an hour and a half. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm not journaling. I do the um, just like writing, like writing articles, yes. writing. I just writing, just yes. poetry, whatever you know, yeah. just something. I journal in the evening. I used to journal in the morning, but then I it would like burn out my writing capacity, so I couldn't do them both. Yeah. But I'm just playing with some of that. But it is nice for me to have. A morning time that is again about living deliberately yes yeah uh, another thing that i uh, loved uh, to read about in your book was when you talk about rewilding you see that you say that rewilding people back to their felt sense of all aspect of their space that we have become too domesticating domesticated so you say rewilding people back to their felt sense of all aspects of their space can you speak some more about Mm. that yeah um well it goes back to that idea of culture and all the narratives and stories and expectations that just get layered upon us from the moment we're born um and again, when you really examine them, they're not based on anything factual. <laughs> they're just based on belief systems. So I envision and I hope for um, a humanity that is free. Um, and, and I don't mean free without any responsibility. It, when you're free, you realize too that you, you are part of the whole. So there's a responsibility with that freedom. But that responsibility doesn't include bending yourself into a pretzel so that you can fit in. That's not your responsibility. So rewilding to me is an embodied, again, to go back to the body, an embodied, deep, warm acquaintanceship with all the ways you feel the world, um, all the beautiful impulses that are there that we often squash and put away and put over to the side. Um, and and the, the deep recognition that you're not broken in any way. Um, you may have awkwardnesses and different proclivities that are, you know, challenging, but that that's okay. That's all just part of the picture. And, and to not let that in any way limit um, just your full expression of who you are as a human. Yeah, I you you speak about interception. This this term called interception, our awareness of our subtle sensory body based <clears throat> feelings, and you say that the greater that awareness, the greater our potential to control our lives. Mm. And this noticing of sensations is very is the neuro- neurobiology of our own selfhood, and I suppose. Mm-hmm that many of us modern human beings have lost the capacity to feel that interception, to 
to feel our subtle sensory body from the inside. Absolutely. And I would say, I would say it even more assertively. I, it was, it was um, punished out of us when we were small. Most, most of us were told, don't feel that, you know, don't express this. Um, that feeling is wrong. Uh, uh, no, you didn't feel that, you know, all of, and so <clears throat> we were systematically, excuse me, <clears throat> we were um, systematically just numbed out from the neck down. And we learned to ignore and numb and, tr and diminish all these sensations that are, that tell us a, a lot of information a lot of information about ourselves, a lot of information about the world out there, about people's intention. Um, and if we were a wild animal and we had been numbed out like that, we wouldn't survive because it's those neural receptors that, that they're like long invisible whiskers that feel the world around us and tell us so much. So there's, you know, there's introception, there's proprioception, which is how we feel, you know, our, our, our place in space yeah. and our, you know, how I can feel the distance between me and the table. And then there's ex, exteroception, which is, you know, how we feel the others. And those three are very, very important. Um, but when we don't use neural receptors, then they, they get blunted. Yeah. And, um, and so we then forget how to feel ourselves. So a lot of the work I do with people is sort of waking those neural receptors back up again yeah. and giving them permission to feel things. And I suppose this also has to do with the left and the right brain, that we only use our left brain. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the difference between the light, right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Well, way oversimplifying, but yes. the left is, you know, logic, the right is creative, intuitive. Um, both are wonderful. Yes, we're, absolutely. We're meant to have both. Yes. But the, le the left is very good at advocating for itself, right? Because it's, it, <laughs> because it, you know, it's the one that writes the articles and does the research and, and makes the social media platforms. That's all left, right? And so, and the right is all about like listening and, <clears throat> you know, being curious. And, and so that's, it, it never gets to advocate for itself. Yeah. So it's not that it's not that forward. <laughs> that's right. Right. It, it's the introvert of the two, I'm sure. So um, so when we I I you know, I don't know this for sure, but my guess is that when we start to listen to our bodies and and be curious about our bodies and and our um and the way the world affects us and the way we respond to the world and start to deeply acquaint ourselves with that, then more of that right hemisphere comes online. Here, is this the right? Yeah, no, it's my left, the right hemisphere comes online. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. I see it opposite in the screen. Yeah, it's on the screen. <laughs> and it's very interesting how you talk about safety and, and you talk about safety, which is very important. Uh, one of the principles within a herd, that they need safety, mm -hmm. but we humans obviously do too. You talk about safety and then you talk about space and you talk about place. That was so interesting. It was just so interesting. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about space, how space and healthy boundaries feel safe and, and trustworthy. And that mm. space is not what separates us. That space can connect us. That's very yes, yes, yes. It's that was probably my favorite chapter to write. The the one on space. Um, and so, um, so just a bit of context. You know that the and I touched on it briefly before that the horses. Um, organize around five basic premises, uh, va values, we can call them safety, connection, peace, joy, freedom, those five. Um, and safety, of course, being primary, as you say. So one of the ways that they create safety is through this idea of space. And if you see horses kind of gathered around in a herd, you'll notice they create, have little space bubbles around them that there, it's about six feet that goes around them. And, and um, this, this space bubble 
is is real. You can measure it through an electromagnetic um, you know device, and it's it's what some scientists call the flight zone. It's where um, if someone were to come, if you were to try to chase a lizard, for example, to catch it, there'd be a point where you could get only so close and then boom, he takes off. And that's because you've touched his little space bubble. Yeah. So this is how they navigate one, with one another is and negotiate kind of where, who someone, where someone goes is that they don't need to necessarily make contact. They can um, kind of, make a suggestion towards that space bubble. So that's where they set their boundaries or, or and that's also where they contact one another, but there's layers of um, permission to come in and get really close contact. Now we're exactly the same. Every animal has this, Yeah. but because of culture, we've been domesticated away from our space bubble. People have, we, we've been told, well, we aren't even told we have a space bubble. We aren't taught how to navigate with it. Um, people get their bubbles violated all the time. Children get their bubbles violated all the time. And, um, and so, and so we, what they, what studies have shown is that domesticated animals have smaller space bubbles. Yeah. That they so we humans, of... we humans also have sm small space bu bubbles, and it actually doesn't make us feel safe. It makes us feel no. unsafe. Right. So I have a, you know, a theory that the, the kind of explosion of anxiety disorders is because we've stopped listening to ourselves yes. and we and our space bubbles, and and this isn't just physical space. It's also psychic space, spiritual space, emotional space, mental space, the whole thing. And so because we aren't taught that we have one, we're not taught how to take care of it. We're not taught how to have boundaries around it. Yeah. Um, and, and so we, you know, we are, our bodies become anxious because our bodies are going, hey, 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 something's up. You know, we're not, you're not listening. <laughs> and it's because we're not respecting our, our internal need for setting boundaries and having that mm -hmm. space bu bubble mm -hmm. for ourselves. It's so interesting. Yeah. 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 So what you notice with the horses is that the space doesn't separate them, although you visually it looks separate, but it's, it's the empty space is like a conduit where lots of information happens, lots and lots of information. And, and respecting each other's space creates connection. So you're connected through all the information that's passing between you, but you're also connected because there's a, reciprocity a mutualism of respecting those space bubbles yeah. right so what people learn when they set boundaries when they work on setting boundaries and we do it in the presence of the herd is that you can make a request to a horse and set a boundary with him you can say i want you to step back please and the horse will not be offended the horse will actually give a positive response because he he goes wow you know how to do this you know how to navigate space therefore you're a safe individual therefore i can trust you yeah. and it actually connects you to the horse yeah by dancing with that space why by asking the horse to do something or to step back yeah i and thought so people this learn that the boundaries are actually connectors boundaries are not like walls that you're putting up between you and the world that that and that then makes it hard for people to set boundaries because they don't want to do this and yeah. that's why it's so hard for them to do it with people that they love yeah because that that doesn't make sense to do that so boundaries are a very dynamic flowing moving um way to create connection through authenticity mm -hmm. you're basically saying here is where i start and stop yeah. And there's where you start and stop. And I want to dance with you in that. Yeah. I, I, I love also, this was one really an eye opener for me, but you mentioned it now about the re re requests. Mm -hmm. Like we also are cultured often to think, depending on who we're speaking to, to some people, we make far too many requests maybe. And to others, we, we're scared of making them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, loved, I loved what you said about, uh, you say that requests are not disrespectful requests are connection you say that was mm, eye-opening to me <laughs> well 
you know, again, our culture has, um, you know, warped the sense of leadership. And when I use the word leadership, I mean very broadly in the way that we lead our own lives. And so requests are part of that leadership. And so we've been taught that requests are very like this, and that's very separating. But, it, but when you look at it through this other framework, this other mindset of safety, connection, and peace, and joy, and freedom, and you see that requests serve to create clarity, to create deliberateness between you and other, to show who you really are. Um, oftentimes what people are reacting to if you're making a request isn't so much what you're saying, but it's all the energy that's underneath it. So if you're feeling ambivalent about your request or you're feeling annoyed that you have to make a request or you know any of these things, yeah, so it's a clean request. It needs to be yeah, heartfelt clean. and honest right. and very simple, no? Right. With you know that all this thing that goes on is unnecessary. So what's it like? And I challenge my clients to practice little requests in ways that are easy and just play with, you know, finding a, a, a kind of neutral place where it's simply a request. It doesn't mean anything intrinsically about the other. It doesn't mean anything intrinsically about you. What could a simple request like that be, like a small request that you can practice with, that people can practice with? That's a, that's a great, well, you know, it depends on, it depends on <clears throat> you know, how, how a challenge somebody is, but it can be, as, it, it can be, so, the, the easiest, easiest is with people you don't know, like somebody at a grocery store, say, and then requesting this bag instead of that bag, right? Right? I mean, just simple, but but to use that as a kind of laboratory to experiment with- With your own with energy. What, yeah, what happened? Like, was even, was even that super triggering for me, you know? Um, I'm an empath and so making requests is very tricky because I, I feel the other even sometimes before I feel myself. Yeah. And I'm already figuring everything out over there. And yeah. so it makes the request kind of muddled. I want to do a class on assertiveness training for empaths because, <laughs> because it's tricky. So, you know, to, to, to use these simple requests as a place to like learn about that in yourself and, and what is, you know, what are what is in the architecture of your request? What shows up there, and where is it trickier? In what environments is it trickier? Yeah, and it's it's so interesting and so important because if you want to live a deliberate life instead of just going on autopilot, if you want to live a deliberate life, you have to be able to make requests because you want exactly. to be deliberate. You you want what you want because for a reason, and this gets us into place because I'm aware of our time. I am. <laughs> 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 you, say, you say that um uh you say in regard to place you write we sense there is a more significant dignity to claim for our lives mm -hmm. and and you call it finding our place and you say that place in this context refers to an existential place a sense of meaningful purpose i mean just reading it an existential place, a sense of meaningful purpose, just mm. so important. So mm. how, do you, how do you work with that? So it goes to this sense of belonging to the greater whole. Um, that, <clears throat> you know, we, it's easy for, for some of us to have a sense of place as in location. But this is an existential place of belonging, no matter where you go in the world. <clears throat> no matter where you are in your, you know, in your life circumstances, to have a, to anchor oneself to something that is so much deeper than any of the external circumstances, or even some of the kind of outer layer of internal circumstances, meaning, you know, your mood or, you know, what, what mind state you're in, that even deeper than that is a place of just being whole in and of oneself. It's very difficult to talk about. Yeah. Um, but again, I go to nature to let that presence inform my body what that's like. So 
if I hang out with a tree, for example, and just feel what it's what it must be like to be rooted in that way, to be whole in that way, and feel it in my own body, then I get a sense of that kind of existential belonging, that existential sense of place. Yeah. Um, to me, that's sort of your your most important fidelity to yourself. And it's, it's even prior to being a human being, it's something deeper than that. I'm not sure if I've even answered the question. Well, I think you have, because this is very intuitive. And I think you used words that make us intuit, this belonging and this wholeness mm -hmm. that's underneath all the noise. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's underneath this, all the noise, yeah. yeah. This deep exactly. belonging to ourselves <laughs> and the web of life, no? And as we've talked this whole hour, I think what you've done is this brilliant job of kind of showing how all of these things support each other. Other, absolutely. Living, de living deliberately helps you to listen. <clears throat> Listening helps you to drop into beingness. Beingness helps you to, to feel all of the world around you and be more responsive. Like it all, you know, understanding your space helps you to get quiet helps you to feel more authentic about how you move in the world. It all reinforces itself. Yes. And we need to learn many tools to be able mm -hmm. to come into the fullness of our lives. Mm -hmm. These yeah. tools that you talk about. So I, um, before we end, I must say to our listeners that reading Kelly's book is there's a lot of like uh, theory, like what we've been talking about here, me and Kelly, like, we talk about space, we talk about place, we talk about belonging and all these things. But I must tell you, the stories she tells, she takes <laughs> concrete examples of her clients, CEOs and normal people, all sorts of people that come to her farm in Santa Fe and that who interact with her herd of horses and then how she observes the interaction between the horses. I, I, I get goosebumps when I speak about it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like reading a novel. It's so exciting to see how the horses mirror back what's actually going on in a person. So this book is an easy read because it's all the time theory. And then you get these great stories from real life mm -hmm. when, when people interact with their horses and how it affects them and how they can mm -hmm. learn from the horses. So please get... Um, uh, Kelly Wender's book called Flying Lead Change, 56 Million Years of Wisdom for Leading and Living. And I know we didn't even talk about flying lead change, but do get the book. You will be yeah. intrigued <laughs> to learn what a flying lead change is, which I, I didn't know this term. And I was like, wow, when I read about <laughs> it. So hopefully this uh, sparks your curiosity to get this really, really wonderful book. I really congratulate you. Thank uh, you Kelly. so much. Thank you so much, Dorita. It's been really lovely to have time with you. And, you know, I wanted to share too that there's little exercises at the end of every chapter too, so people can engage actively, experientially themselves. They don't have to have a horse in the Yes, in the living room with them. That's true. It's a very <laughs> practical book because after every chapter, there are practical exercises that awaken you, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So th thank you so much, Kelly. And to, and, uh, yeah. yeah. And to all our listeners, I cannot recommend Kelly Wendor's book enough. There was uh, so much tangible wisdom uh, to learn from it. So I truly recommend the book. And once more, thank you for this inspiring conversation and yeah. for listening to our listeners to Intimacy with the World podcast with me, Dorita Holm. And please be sure to subscribe to the podcast and leave a comment. And if you are with us on YouTube, please like the video and leave a comment. This greatly helps other interested people find these inspiring conversations. And it also helps me and um, uh, everybody who's interested. Be well, everybody, and see you next week. Now, before I leave you completely, I just wanted to let you know that in collaboration with the Adventure Syndicate, I am offering a very special online mindfulness course with focus on our inner wildness and on how intimacy with nature can teach us so much about ourselves, about how to be in our bodies and in the world in more wholesome and authentic ways, which will, of course, bring more well-being to ourselves and others. This course starts on the 2nd of February, 2021, 
And for more information about this six session online course, where we explore this inner wildness and freedom through nature, just go to my website, which is doritaholm.com. And on my website, you can also sign up for a free coaching session with me. I coach people through all sorts of life situations from mindfulness and personal growth to getting more clarity in your life and find more purpose and transforming your intentions into becoming reality. So if you would like to schedule a free 25 minute session with me, please go to my website, doritaholm.com, go to coaching and find a date and time that suits you. Thanks again so much for listening and watching and please like the YouTube video, subscribe. This greatly helps others find these inspiring conversations and it does also help me. So see you next week for a new episode of Intimacy with the World and please be well.